Hey, what's up ladies and gentlemen? In this video we're going to talk about real gases. So you might be asking yourself, well is there such a thing as a fake gas? And the answer is no. However, the distinction is not between real gases and fake gases. Rather, the distinction is between real gases and ideal gases. So we've been talking over and over and over again about the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT, but what we haven't talked about so much is uh, what it means for a gas to be displaying ideal gas behavior and when it isn't displaying ideal gas behavior. And so that's what we're going to talk about in this video. Now a couple of videos ago uh, I posted a video where we talked about some applications of the ideal gas law. And one of the things that we did in that video is we determined the molar volume, that is the volume of one mole of a gas, we determined the molar volume of an ideal gas under conditions of standard temperature and pressure or STP and we found it to be 22.4 liters and if you take that value to four significant figures it ends up being 22.41 liters and so in this graph here what we're doing is we're comparing the molar volume of an ideal gas to the molar volumes of uh, some various gases listed here and we can see here that the molar volume of an ideal gas is very, very close to the molar volumes of all of these gases. However, it's not the same as the molar volume of all these gases. Notice that the molar volume of chlorine gas uh, is 22.06 liters, so that's uh, less than the uh, molar volume of an ideal gas. And then if we look over there at hydrogen gas, that's actually uh, just uh, one hundredth of a liter larger than the molar volume of an ideal gas. So what's going on? Why aren't these gases behaving like they should? So that's what we're going to talk about in this video. So in order to understand this, we need to understand some assumptions uh, about the ideal gas law. So that whole PV equals NRT uh, has some implicit assumptions within it. And there's two main assumptions of the ideal gas law. The first one is that the volume of the particles is negligible. So this is should look kind of familiar because we talked about this a little bit with the kinetic molecular theory. So again, what that means is that the volume of those gas particles is so small compared to the volume of the container that you can pretty much disregard it and assume that the particles have zero volume. The other assumption of the ideal gas law is that the particles aren't interacting with one another. So they're not really attracting one another or repelling one another. They're pretty much just moving around. And yes, they do collide with one another, uh, but before and after those collisions, they're not really pulling or pushing on each other. And so the question here is, well, when do these two assumptions become invalid? And the answer is that these two assumptions become invalid when the pressures are high and when the temperatures are low. So for instance, uh, suppose we have uh, a sample of gas in this uh, cylinder here with a piston up there. See that piston? And we have these gas particles here. Notice that, uh, that it's a fairly large container, so the volume of those individual gas particles is uh, negligible compared to the volume of the entire container. But what if we were to uh, push down on that piston. Well, we would effectively be reducing the volume and increasing the pressure of this gas. And so if we do that, we have a much smaller container. The pressure is much, much higher. And so now the volume of those individual gas particles starts to become more and more important. So that's what we mean when uh, we say that this uh, assumption uh, that the volume of those particles is negligible kind of breaks down uh, when the pressures get higher and higher and higher. But uh, when you have standard temperature and pressure or just atmospheric pressure, uh, the ideal gas law is a pretty fair assumption. And so there was this dude uh, over in Amsterdam a little while back uh, named Johan van der Waals. Uh, that's him over there on the right side of this photograph. He's just kind of uh, kind of chilling in his laboratory there. And uh, he really liked gases a lot. He really liked uh, energy and thermodynamics and stuff like that a lot. And he came up with an equation uh, that can uh, pretty much govern the behavior of real gases. And so it goes kind of like this. Well, if we take a look at the ideal gas law equation, again, that's PV equals NRT. And if we divide both sides of the ideal gas law equation by pressure, we get the following. We get V equals NRT over P. And so 
uh, Mr. Vanderwall's over there, he suggested a uh, sort of a correction factor uh, within this equation. Uh, and that correction factor uh, is the quantity NB. So it becomes V equals NRT over P plus NB. N, again, that's the amount of the gas in moles, so it's no different from the N in PV equals NRT. And then B, that is a constant uh, that is characteristic to each gas. So each gas, uh, each individual ga <coughs> gas has its own B value. And so if we arrange this equation, uh, it becomes V minus NB equals NRT over P. So this is basically a corrected version of the ideal gas behavior that accounts for the fact that, well, maybe the volume of those particles isn't so negligible after all, which again only is really true when the pressures are really, really, really high. Uh, there is another uh, correction uh, that Mr. Vanderwalls uh, suggested, and that has to do with um, when you have really uh, low temperatures. Because remember, we said that the ideal gas law isn't very good when the pressures are high and when the temperatures are low. But why would the ideal gas law be inadequate when the temperatures are low? Well, the answer is, well, if you think about a collection of gas particles, if they're really hot, that means they have a lot of kinetic energy, they're moving around very fast. And so when the particles are moving around very fast, they don't really spend a lot of time interacting with one another. They don't really spend a lot of time pushing and pulling on one another. However, if the gas starts to get really, really cold, well, now they're their, their uh, kinetic energy is greatly reduced. They're moving around much more slowly. And so now they have a lot more time to attract and repel one another. And so that's why the ideal gas law isn't very valid at low temperatures as well as high pressures. And so again, if we look at the ideal gas law equation again, we have V equals NRT over P, just like we did in the last slide. Uh, but then uh, Van der Waals actually suggested uh, another correction factor that corrects for intermolecular forces. And again, those are forces, attractions, and repulsions within mole uh, between molecules. And so this uh, correction looks kind of like this, where we have V equals NRT over P. And then the correction factor is uh, done by subtracting the quantity A times N over V squared. So again, N, that's the amount of the gas in moles. V, that's the volume, just as in PV equals NRT. And so if we arrange this equation around, uh, we can get the following. We get V plus the quantity A uh, times N over V squared is equal to NRT over P. And the letter A corresponds to a constant as well. So in the last slide, we looked at the correction for particle volume, uh, that was B, and then the correction for intermolecular forces, that's a lowercase a. And just like the B value, the A value is gonna be a constant that's unique to each individual gas. So each individual gas has its own A and B values. And so if we bring everything all together, we arrive at what's called the Van der Waals equation, which again governs the behavior of real gases, which you only really want to pull out the Van der Waals equation when you need to. In other words, you should only use the Van der Waals equation uh, when the pressures are high and the temperatures are low. Otherwise, you can just use the ideal gas law and in most cases that will serve you just fine. And so if we combine those two corrections together, the correction for particle volume and the correction for intermolecular forces, we arrive at this big long equation right here where we have the quantity of P times A N over V squared multiplied by V minus NB, all of that is equal to NRT. Notice we have the correction for intermolecular forces over there being added to the pressure. And then over here, we have the correction for particle volume subtracted uh, from the volume. And so this is the Van der Waals equation. And if you want to know what A and B are, again, it's going to be unique to each individual gas. Every gas has its own A and B values. And you should be able to find uh, a reference table with uh, A and B values for various gases uh, somewhere in your chemistry textbook. Okay, that is it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, all right, have a good one.